Um, I'm here um, to tell the story of why I changed research topics in my early 60s. After 40 years, after 40 years of exploring medieval European visual narrative focused on stained glass windows of French Gothic churches, that's the me on the left, um, in my early 60s, I decided to move the art historical methods and interpretive tools that I had developed studying painted windows to attempt to break the visual codes of painted bowls produced by the prehistoric Membres people who lived in what is now southwest New Mexico. In the brief time I have to talk to you this evening, I want to share some thoughts on two things. Number one, why I did this, and number two, how it's going. In the process, I hope to introduce you to an astonishingly sophisticated painting tradition from around 1000 to 1150 that is largely unknown in the world of art history. I studied medieval... I studied medieval stained, European stained glass in two ways. Essentially, I had two different research projects. First, probing the structures and objectives of visual narration in what is arguably the major medium in Gothic Europe of painting. And two, reconstructing the nature of artistic production in this period when there are few written sources on artists' practice, but considerable variation in style, technique, and approach in surviving windows. When turning, to the prehistoric bowls, I have taken with me the interpretive toolkit I developed in the second of these projects. I'm seeking to reconstruct the nature of artistic production in the prehistoric Southwest, where there are no sources on artistic practice, but considerable variation in style among surviving artifacts. Let me just say what's happening. <laughs> is that I'm only getting every other image. So I'm going to keep going and, and see, what, see how it goes, all right? Um, for some reason, I'm only getting every other image. Why the switch? It all goes back to a trip with my family to Montezuma's castle in northern Arizona, which you see on the screen. As I read the historical documentation at the site on those big historical markers, I came to the, for me, new realization that this monument was contemporary with my European Gothic churches, flourishing in the 12th and 13th centuries on different sides of the globe. To say the least, I was intrigued. I needed to understand the relationship. So I decided to begin very broadly with sabbatical support from Swarthmore in 2010 to do two things. First, to develop a new undergraduate course on native North American art, which I think is really needed at Swarthmore. And second, to discover a place in this material to start a new research project of my own. You see, teaching and research are best when they develop together. That's one of the axioms of liberal arts education. Well, the sabbatical did not go very well. I struggled to find a way even to organize the course because of its diversity and political sensitivity. And I struggled to find a research area because I was frustrated by the art historical literature on the post-conquest material, mostly general and descriptive, lazy even, and the anthropological literature for the pre-conquest material. There was almost no art historical literature on that which used methods that were unfamiliar to me and drew conclusions from curious criteria that inspired very little confidence in an art historian. This landscape changed unexpectedly and dramatically during my flight back to Philadelphia after 10 months in Arizona. In Arizona. Let me, um, that's the inside of the book I'm just about to talk about that you would have seen the cover in the slide that's not showing. Um, on the plane, literally on the plane, flying back to Philadelphia from Phoenix, I read a book on Membres painted pottery by Stephen LeBlanc, an anthropologist, archeologist from the Peabody Museum at Harvard, and was completely blown away. I had read quite a bit about the Membres during my ex explorations, but, this, but his book was the first thing 
that actually made any sense at all to me. Um, it was rooted in an analysis of the works themselves, which curiously were illustrated in many of the other books, but not at all discussed. And it used that analysis to probe the nature of the artistic process. It could have been written by an art historian. So as soon as I arrived home, I cold emailed Stephen LeBlanc that very afternoon, asking if he would be interested in coming to Swarthmore to give a talk and to lead a discussion of his work in my first year seminar, which is titled Making Art History. His visit, he did come, he was intrigued, and he has two kids in school, so he was happy to have the opportunity to make a little extra cash, um, <laughs> was transformational, and not only for my students. It ends up he was actually looking for an art historian to collaborate with him on a project he initiated to divide the extant membranes painted bowls. There are about 10,000 of them in existence, and Stephen estimates, and he does this um, in a way that I would never feel comfortable doing. He estimates four or five bowls have been lost for the 10,000 that we have, and this was over about a 150-year period that they were produced, so that gives you a sense of how important the production of these bowls was uh, during this century and a half. And he's attempting to divide them into what I would call style groups and probe whether these style groups could represent the work of individual painters or individualizable workshops of painters. Well, that's exactly the kind of um, investigation and the sorts of questions that motivated one half of my stained glass research. So I volunteered to join him um, in this project, and he decided to take the risk. He really didn't know very much about me um, or very much about art history, actually. Um, so we tried out the collaboration. There we are at the Peabody Museum at Harvard. I spent three days with him as a kind of test. He was testing me, I was testing the subject. I didn't need to test him. And things went really well. Um, ideas crackled. We challenged each other. We disagreed. Um, we laughed. We, we got to know these bowls in a way that's exactly the best part of humanity's research because they're, they're about the t tissue of human interaction. And if the research can be like that, um, it's usually most productive, I think. So, so we soon planned out a research project program, applied for grants, and set out to work. I had um, a lot of catching up to do. So I spent the first semester of last year, which was another sabbatical year for me, reading through the literature. And then I started going with him to see bowls. This shows, this is um, um, Stephen and I are standing at the um, National Museum of the American Indian at the Smithsonian in Washington, which actually on the mall exhibits zero membranes bowls, but in storage in Suitland, Maryland has 350 in storage. And what they did, because he had connections, I didn't, they took out all 350 bowls and put them in table, on tables. And for two days we got to, um, move them around, put them into groups, see if they, um, if they looked like they'd been painted in the same way, judge their technique, judge their style, sort them into subject matters. Um, and we were off on a start. We've since been to the, um, um, I've since been to, to Fayetteville, Arkansas, where at the University of Arkansas there's a fabulous collection of membranes, bowls, Museum of Northern Arizona, American Museum of Natural History um, in New York. Um, um, so the project is going on. Let me tell you a little bit about the membranes. Um, let me situate them geographically. The map does that visually for me, so I don't have to do that. As I said, it's in southwest New Mexico, and that's what the terrain looks like today. It's a river valley. Um, the Membres is the name of the river given by the Spanish explorers who arrived four centuries after the Membres were gone, um, but the Membres have taken their name. Um, Nobody knew anything about the Membres until the early 20th century when ranchers in this area started uncovering bowls having them drawn and sending pictures to Washington to the Smithsonian. Um, and the Smithsonian director got on the next train and came out to New Mexico to see them. Throughout the first part of the, that's another view of the Membres River on the left, um, through the early part of the 20th century, excavations were sent from Harvard, from Beloit College in Wisconsin, from the University of Minnesota in Minneapolis, uh, from southwestern New Mexico University, from a variety of places, and those bowls then came back with them um, and started receiving attention. But I want to situate these, the membranes for you. There are other cultures in this part of the world that some of you might know about, even have visited. Uh, the Chaco culture in north of membranes, the membranes valley in New Mexico, is known for these spectacular architectural 
uh, monuments in cliffs, including Montezuma's castle, which is actually by the Sinawa people who are related um, to, the, to the Chaco culture. And that was what was getting all the attention in the early part of the 20th century, uh, because the Membres didn't live in apartment complexes built into cliffs, but in low Pueblo um, installations like the one reconstructed here. I've brought in a group of bowls, and let me, um, since I, I'm dealing with a, with a small group of pictures, let me, let me, let me, um, let me do it this way. Um, there are 10,000 bowls, and they divide neatly into groups. Obviously, if you're looking with 10,000 bowls, you gotta divide them into some way to get a hold of them. Um, there are geometric bowls, like the one at bottom left. There are bowls with animals on them, like top left, bottom right, and there are bowls with human beings on them, the one at top right. Most of the attention has been given to the bowls with human beings, because let's just face it, human beings, when looking at works of art, tend to like to focus on pictures of other human beings. Abstract art is, you know, loved by a group of people who um, see themselves as specialists in cognoscenti today, but actually people are drawn to pictures of people, let's just be honest about it. And that's what people wanted to study. I've developed this notion that, I've developed this notion that the most sophisticated paintings of the Mimbres were actually the geometric bowls, which is unsettling to the anthropologists who really want to understand the figural bowls. But you know what? We have no idea what these bowls mean. Nor, I think, will we ever have any idea what these bowls mean because we have no texts. There was no written language developed to record things down. And when the Spanish came and started writing secondary accounts of everything they saw in the Southwest, um, the membranes were long gone. Membres culture, the, the bowls that you're looking at, the ones that I've been showing you, are from what's called the classic period of membranes history from 1000 to 1150. That's an art historical word that creeped into the anthropological lexicon, classic period. Um, in 1150, they're practically gone. The membranes disappear. The sites are abandoned. The bolds are covered up. That's why we have them. They stop being used. And they were buried. 70 to 75% of the bolds we have were found in graves. Often, as in this picture, placed like a hat on the top of the head of the corpse that was often placed in a fetal position, and human um, burials were under the floors of habitations. The, the dead were buried within the house, um, underneath the floors. Anthropo you know, I'm coming into this project after a whole bunch of anthropologists have been through working on it, and there's been a lot of work to try to figure out, is there a pattern to the type of bowl that's buried with the type of people? Did men have one kind of bowls? Did women have another kind of bowls? Did children have another kind of bowls? Did one family group have one kind of bowl? Did another family? No, con no pattern has been discovered yet. I'm not interested um, in discovering that pattern. What I'm interested in doing, and this is why I got involved in the project with Stephen LeBlanc, because it was, first of all, as a medievalist, okay, my, my research has primarily been in the Middle Ages. I'm interested in the visual arts. I came into this because I love decoding visual language, structures, compositions, um, the way pictures are put together, because I think that's where their meaning actually is centered. And just as a quick political aside, since the next generation is growing up in a world in which pictures are the primary modes of communication, we really better start teaching this to them at a young age. Nobody's doing this, because nobody thinks that pictures actually are constructed meanings, when actually they are. So I've loved de deconstructing, cracking codes of, of medieval visual material primarily because we don't have art critical literature to contend with. I don't have to talk about what people at the time thought about it because they didn't write it down. Um, there are all kinds of problems with that, but that's a liberating notion for me. So with the membranes, there are no texts. So I don't have to read um, Latin saints' lives to figure out the emphasis in, in narrative, and I loved that. Um, but I'm totally free of the text. And what I'm, what I'm, you know, in the years I have left, 
Uh, you, you know, if, with luck, I'll have a good 20 years left of this. I'm counting on it. I just want to bring these bowls to the attention of the art historical world, which in the next couple of centuries will figure them out. And I think I can do that by sorting out, sorting the bowls into individual artists. This maker group, which is on the screen, uh, I'll leave you with. Um, it's by a painter whom I call the um, vinegaroon painter. Um, the, the animals at upper left are whip scorpions. I didn't even know there were whip scorpions. I live part-time in Arizona. I know about scorpions, but I've never seen a whip scorpion. Um, they don't have stingers. Uh, they have whip tails. Um, and they're called vinegaroons. And she painted vinegaroons on two bowls. And I'm naming her after these bowls. And we think these were painted by women. That's why I'm using um, the female pronoun. We have one piece of information. One grave of a woman from the pre-classical period includes potter's tools. No other grave includes potter's tools. So the conclusion is that women made pots. Whether women painted pots is another story altogether. I mean, if you, if you look at contemporary examples, Maria Martinez, uh, famous Santo Domingo uh, potter, actually made the pots, but her husband, Hooligan, painted the, the bowl, the painted the pot. So it may have been, we don't know how, the, we don't know how this was, but, but I find it interesting, and I'll leave you with two thoughts, th this thought. This is probably, and you know, scholars love to overemphasize the importance of what they do, okay? This is potentially the first American painting tradition in which we have individualizable makers. I mean, think about that. We take that as a, for granted in art, but it's not something that's taken for granted. Some cultures don't have an identifiable, but the, the identifiableness of this stuff is really pretty stunning. So it's the first identifiable kind of personal style, if we want to put it in those terms, painting tradition in North America. And it probably was women who painted them. So I'm going to continue to believe that's the case. And second, I don't want to leave without taking you round circle to the first part of my sabbatical to work on this. I finally figured out a way to teach the course, which is going to be offered in the fall for the first time. Thank you.